Welcome to Horror After Midnight. I am your host, KC, here tonight with uh, Slinky Jallo. And we have a very special guest, Mr. Tony Wash. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for coming in, man. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, not a problem. You know, again, we, uh, we're we all kind of sitting at home trying to isolate ourselves and get rid of this stupid pandemic. So what better, what better way than to sit and bullshit about horror? Yeah, after my own heart, sir, after my own heart. <laughs> so absolutely, absolutely. But no, again, thank you for joining us. This is great. And uh, all right, let's get into it, fellas. <laughs> Um, Tony, uh, what inspired you to uh, do a film like Skeletons in the Closet? Uh, I, well, Skeletons in the Closet, I mean, you, if, if you watch it, you, you can tell pretty right right out the gate that yeah. it's a, a, an ode to, you know, the older kind of horror host, hostess shows, Elvira, um, Tales from the Crypt, you know, yeah. I... Paul Bear, stuff like that, yeah. Definitely, definitely. You know, I mean, in Chicago here, we have Sven Gulli. Um, So, you know, I, I grew up on that type of stuff when I was younger, before I could start watching the really gory, R-rated horror content. Um, I was born in 1980. So, you know, growing up in the 80s, there was so much awesome horror stuff. Like, Freddy Krueger was almost like Mickey Mouse to a lot of people. And... Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I was a horror fan right out, right out of the womb, but and, and my father's a big horror fan too, but my mother wouldn't let me watch certain movies. So I kind of had to be restricted to the black and white stuff. Um, and, and so, you know, Elvira was some of the things that my dad actually was able to rent for he and I to watch. Um, and so, you know, she used to have those old VHS tapes of like, you know, a single movie that she would watch, kind of like her show. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, so basically that's kind of how I got introduced to the genre. And um, and Skeletons in the Closet is kind of my homage to that. Uh, when I went to college, I was kind of working on some different ideas, both in my creative writing class as well as just kind of on the side independently i i figured well shit maybe i can like you know write a couple of scripts and have some some time here while i'm at school to shoot a movie which didn't end up happening i shot some uh some short film content but ultimately the idea for the widow and charlie which are the the host and hostess of the show skeletons in the closet mm -hmm. um came to me while i was in college and i just thought it seems like a perfect idea to I, to combine the Elvira kind of dynamic with the Crypt Keeper and make them a married couple, kind of like Al and Peg Bundy. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of where it came from. I love the dynamic with those characters, man. Like, it was really cool. It was really funny to, you know, see how they interacted with each other. It was, you know, um, and the way the film is, or the way you did it, you can tell you have a great appreciation for the throwbacks or you know it, it was awesome it was awesome to see that thanks so. yeah we um back in 2012 uh i had been contacted to be a part of an anthology uh where there was going to be four of us um chicago area filmmakers that would each produce a short horror film um with our own time and money and crew and then we were going to put them all together and make an anthology you know this is right after uh vhs had come out and a couple of other you know trick or treat was pretty popular at the time so um we we started organizing this project called chop shop and each of us ended up each of the four directors ended up making a 20 minute short film mine was graham o'malley's pantry and uh my co-director on Skeletons in the Closet, Ben Lewandowski, his short was The Dismantler, which is The Two Guys in the Junkyard. And so we had these two short films, and then kind of like two or three years into post-production, because, you know, stuff ends up taking a long time, and <coughs> ultimately, uh, um, you know, we were working on post-production for Chop Shop, but at the same time, we were also working on World of Death, which is my web series that we curate through bloodydisgusting.com. 
Um, mm-hmm. And we were also working on uh, the short film, The Muck, uh, which we took to South by Southwest and a bunch of other festivals. And then we started developing The Rake, uh, which is my third feature film. Um, and we were also working on the post-production for High in the Hog, which is my second feature film that we could talk about too. And so all the time, you know, we, we were just taking a lot of time working on all these different things because we were really kind of spreading ourselves out. And after about two years of working on Chop Shop, we realized that the four of us directors could not get on the same page about what we wanted to do with the overall anthology. And so we kind of split the thing apart. And um, and so the other two of the other directors went and took their shorts and just kind of released them as shorts. And and I had my short and, and I really liked it, but I didn't want to release it as a 20 minute short because at film festivals, they don't really like they don't like really long short films and they don't like short feature length movies. You know what I mean? So, yeah, OK, OK, it kind of fell in this shitty time duration. And so we had to figure out what we were going to do with them. And so Ben and I were trying to combine them and do something. And eventually I pitched the idea of using the skeletons in the closet as a wraparound for these short films that made up chop shop. And, uh, I basically said, you know, if we take the widow and Charlie and make them the hosts of this show and we can add this, this extra tier where there's this little girl who's their number one fan watching the show with her babysitter. And then we can use our short films as the movies that they're watching on their show. It just ended up working out really well. Um, And then just to kind of give us a couple extra minutes of footage, we, um, we included uh, uh, a friend, Rian Owen. She did a short film called Meisner, which is the actress tied to the chair in the basement. Um, Mm which had originally been produced for world of death. And we talked to her and she wanted to then include her short film as well. And that kind of became a nice little separation piece between the two longer short films. You know, that's how it all turned out to be what it was. Worked that's awesome. Right yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Put together really well. Yeah. It's put together really well, man. Like I wanted to ask you like the actress, the actors and actresses that came on board, were they excited by the idea that it was an anthology and a throwback? Like, were they like, Oh, this is great. You know, um, like, were they fans of horror? That's, you know, <laughs> where, where um, well, you know, I mean, it's kind of different in every case, obviously. I mean, you know, with, when, yeah. when we produced grandma O'Malley's pantry in 2012, um, I, I knew I wanted it to be an eighties movie. I I'm, like the biggest eighties horror fan, um, (laughs) that I know. And so I, I knew I wanted to give it that aesthetic and I take pride in, in Scotchworthy productions, movies Mm -hmm. kind of having a high level of production design, not just uh, a good quality in terms of the, the cinematography, which is all thanks to my, my co-producer, uh, Robert Patrick Stern, who does all of our camera work and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted it to have that production value. So we found the big old house and, and, you know, a bunch of eighties props and the old car and everything. And, um, and, and so that kind of like skeletons in the closet being an, a, a, a horror host hostess kind of dynamic. It felt like it would be appropriate if it was set in the eighties. Um, yeah. And and the little girl laying in front of the old wooden TV console, you know, on the really big ass carpet and and um, <laughs> all the plants in the room and everything is very 1980s. And so that just it felt appropriate to kind of follow that feel throughout mm-hmm. for the entire film, even though Ben's movie, The Dismantler, really does. It's kind of timeless. Um, you know, it's yeah. just two guys in a junkyard. Um <clears throat> And, and I, if you're paying attention, you can see that there's newer cars in the junkyard because when he when we were shooting his movie uh, in 2012 and 2013, it was not a period piece. And so, you know, we didn't really pay attention to getting our shot angles to avoid newer cars. Um, but other than that, it, it was all kind of this this happy accident that we were able to make it work to be an 80s movie. And so I think that as we were going along, 
you know, each movie that we were shooting, each segment of it had a different mentality behind it. Um, and, and people were just excited to be a part of it. And I think the, the best thing is that, you know, I like to think that I don't sound like an idiot and that I, I, I tend to present myself professionally enough so that people become supportive of the project pretty quickly um, because they believe it's professional. And I'm very thankful to be surrounded by a team of amazingly talented and very professional people as well. So, you know, we were we were able to, to get everybody on board really quickly and everybody was excited to do something. And when they would look at the footage after we would shoot it, they would see how amazing Rob and all of his team were able to make stuff look. They were instantly, you know, infatuated with the project as much as we all were. No, that's fantastic. That's great. That's great. Because like I said, you can tell it was a labor of love and you're very, you know, your heart was in it. You can really tell because it does it. It comes off as it has it has that feel. It has that feel to it. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, no, not at all, man. Not at all. Did a great job. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, had like the feel of like the 80s and almost like brought you back to your childhood. It's great. Yeah. See, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I love movies that do that, that transport you, you know, so. I mean, that's what a movie's supposed to do, you know. And, exactly. <laughs> and you don't, you don't often see independent films that, that take the time or have the, the money mm -hmm. or wherewithal to, um, to put that kind of production value into their projects. And that is something that we've taken a lot of pride in, you know, it's the cinematography, it's the production design. And it's the practical special effects, which is something else. You know, I went to Tom Savini's special effects school. Ah, um, awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of the foundation for um, that's where I shot my first feature length movie. I, I shot a movie called It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To, um, which is <laughs> very Night of the Demons meets Creepshow meets Evil Dead. Um, hey, all right, all right. Now we're yeah. talking. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's a group of kids in an abandoned house uh, that used to be a funeral home. Um, and we shot in an actual uh, condemned funeral home in Manesson, Pennsylvania, which is the town where Savini's effects yeah. school is. Um, and uh, when I made the movie, I wanted to give it some sort of special gimmick. So we actually made it a choose your own adventure movie. Um, I and have so many of those books. <laughs> same here. Same yeah, here. And yeah. so um, that, you know, with with the way that you can program a DVD nowadays, we were I knew that I could use my computer software to kind of make this choose your own adventure interactive movie. And mm -hmm. um, and so we went out and we we shot a whole bunch of extra footage so that there's all this additional stuff that's not in the regular movie. Um, that if you have the DVD, you can kind of go and watch it as the Juju Arn Adventure version and, and take the characters down different paths and either kill them and have to start over or, you know, play through the movie in, in different ways and get to a bunch of different endings. Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. They did a, uh, one of the Final Destinations was like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. It, it was a lot of fun, but, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. Um, I, I basically had, you know, some money from, from saving my entire life. And, uh, and so I, I bought a camera. Um, and this is, I shot this, I went to school from 04 to 06. Um, and I was in my mid twenties at the time. And I just, I kind of told myself, I, I went through a breakup. And I was working on, you know, writing the script and producing this movie and kind of midway through it, I broke up with um, my, my long term girlfriend at the time. And I was just kind of like at that point, I spent like a month just kind of going to the bars, drinking and hanging out with my roommate and, and all my friends at school. And I just kind of sat down one night. We were sitting in the bar. And I just like looked at the Coors Light in front of me and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I was like, you know, why, why am I saying I want to be a film director and why am I going to special effects school? And that school was not cheap. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm actually still paying for it. Uh, here it is, you know, however many years later, 15 years later. And, um, 
and you know i was just like i need to just do this and and so i i did it and i didn't know what i was doing i'd never used a big camera before this is right before high definition was was prosumer so it was shot in standard def um which a lot of people kind of like they think it looks older they they think it has that 80s feel to it yeah it has a certain charm about it that yeah adds adds to the aesthetic yeah absolutely yeah but uh but other than that you know it was it still had the practical special effects it was me and all my my special effects school friends you know that we made they did a full body monster um and you know tons of cool gory special effects and so it's a lot of fun and it was a cool movie and that's kind of what got me jump started into you know making films and um i moved back to illinois after school and after we finished shooting the movie and and uh, just kind of been doing it ever since that's great that's great yeah <laughs> um i was going to ask you about the uh the scene with the grandmother and the uh into that short well she's like cutting the leg into like pieces how was that done so the grandma was played masterfully by um, an actress who's since passed away named lee rose um who was an absolute amazing woman to work with um she she was a sag actress she's done all sorts of amazing stuff she she's even a voice for one of the hookers in, in one of the grand theft auto games which is hysterical <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> um and uh so she was all about you know doing the makeup and all that stuff and so my effects supervisor jason kane uh who also went to savini's effects school a couple of years after i had gone there um, and we met on another film I did called A Chance in Hell, which is a World War II Nazi zombie film. Um, nice. And uh, Jason was one of the effects guys on that. And I found out he lived in Illinois, like a, a half an hour from me. And we kind of became friends and, and brothers and have been working on stuff ever since. And so Jason um, wanted, I, I basically told him I wanted the ghoul grandma to look as if she had kind of pulled the skin of her human face over her head kind of like a hoodie you know <laughs> and um and it, but kind of like beetlejuice-esque you know when when alec baldwin and gina davis kind of like deform their faces yeah you know, scary um <laughs> and so so he did this really awesome silicone makeup appliance and he and he taped her lips open and back so that her mouth was more open and her teeth were bearing and um, and he made this whole cowl that kind of looked like it was skin pulled back. And we put in these big sclera contact lenses in her eyes. And, um, and so that's kind of what we do with her. And then the mother um, laying on the table, we built that table. And we put a, a hole in the table to put her real leg through. And then Jason kind of sculpted a, a nub. Um, with a bunch of meat and stuff on it. And we sculpted, um, he cast a leg, or a foot, I mean. And then we used a bone from a skeleton that I had um, and made that fake leg. And, you know, that's kind of how she's sawing it up and everything. And, and, um, and then that house was really great because it was a big old house that a state representative owned in Elgin, Illinois. And he actually had moved out and was living in a townhouse. And they had it on the market for a long time and nobody was buying it. Um, so it was empty. And we were able to get in there for a couple hundred dollars and shoot for like two weeks. Um, and it had that big basement that was divided into a couple of different rooms. So we were able to kind of have the... The, the butcher room in the back of it and the, all the shelves and stuff. And I've been saving olive and cherry jars. I was a bartender for a, for about 10 years. And all that time I was saving um, olive jars and cherry jars at, at work so that because I knew one day I'm going to make this basement and it's going to have all these jars with body parts in it on these shelves and and luckily we finally shot the movie because my mother was like so fucking tired of holding on to boxes and boxes of <laughs> jars because <laughs> i was keeping them at my mom's house one day just one day mom. 
you know <laughs> that's funny that's funny it just it, it all worked out and and um again i'm just i'm very fortunate I've, I've worked with some really amazing people over the years and i've been doing it for 15 years now and um i'm really proud of all the stuff that we've created i i wish that more people see it i i wish that um you know, and that's why I, lo- I love being able to talk to people like you guys. You know, you're you're out there, you know, promoting horror and and talking to people who are your fans. And so hopefully your fans become our fans because um, it's hard nowadays. I mean, as a horror fan, it's great because there's so many movies out there that you can watch. But yeah. the, the tough thing, and, and this is me as a fan, not just as a filmmaker. You know, I've been a fan my whole life, like I said. And... Mm-hmm. Um, it sucks because, you know, there are so many horror movies out there being made every year that you can get lost in the mix. And, and a lot yeah. of the movies really aren't that good. There's a lot of shitty horror movies out there. Oh, thank you. For yeah, that. Don't, don't. <laughs> and we try not to stray our fans wrong when we like do the recommendations and stuff. So it's like, um, we're pretty good about, cause we have a, we have a Facebook page and, um, we, we do recommendations all the time and it's like, we try to pick like, you know, the, the creme de la creme of, you know, horror, like what's out there. And, uh, some people are into it. Some people aren't. And it's just like, we, we try to promote the ones that we love, like that are near and dear to us. And we, we just, like you said, we try to expose people to the stuff that we enjoy, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know it's like it some people get lucky you know some people are in the right place at the right time and they meet the right person who helps filter them through the the networks to get out there and become famous i mean you were talking about art the clown earlier and i think terrifier is a perfect example of a uh, of a situation where here's an independent filmmaker who made I mean, All Hallows Eve. What, what is his name? Damien. Damien. I think you're right. It's Damien. Um, I yeah. I think yeah. it's Damien or Damien. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> so uh, you know, he, here he goes and he makes a movie, All Hallows Eve, which to me was very similar to It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want to. He probably made it for you know sub twenty thousand dollars and you know put it together with a bunch of his friends and. You know, it had that low budget feel to it, but it still had some decent production value and and had some cool moments. And, you know, then went out there and started trying to get together the production for Terrifier, as well as he probably was trying to get other projects going, too. And they all fell apart or, you know, one reason or another, he switched over to a different one. And, you know, I know that Dread Central got behind Terrifier and Steve Barton over at Dread Central was really trying to get that film produced and, and, and working on it. And, and it got made and it, it got, you know, onto Netflix and everybody and their mother who even remotely likes horror went and watched it. And it's now this huge, you know, independent success. And there's so many examples of situations like that where, you know, somebody just happens to be in the right place at the right time. And, and now they're, making movies full time and they're doing it as a living and making money and, and have, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans who enjoy their films. And, yeah. um, you know, we feel like we're, we're hopefully on the path to get to that point. And, um, you know, every project that we do, we look at it and say, Oh, it's, you know, we're, we're really excited about it. And we, we hope that this will be the one and, you know, hopefully one day, hopefully the next one is the project that takes us to the, to the next level where, Again, you know, we've got people coming up to the table at the horror conventions that we go to and are standing there in a line for an hour waiting to get, you know, copies of our movies and talk to our fans and stuff. Um, it's every filmmaker's dream, you know. Now, what, what, when you do a con, what, uh, what, what's that like to have, you know, know there's a line of people that are going to wait an hour just to meet you and have you sign like the Blu-ray and stuff? Like, how, how does that go? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't have that. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> God, I wish. No, that's what it <laughs> I wish I did. I'm far from oh. that. Um, we, we do a lot of the horror conventions. We've done mm-hmm. Mad Monster. We, we, we do a lot of the Days of the Dead. We've done a lot of Horror Hounds. Um, okay. uh, and, and so, you know, I, I've been doing horror conventions since I released It's My Party and I'll Die If I Want To in 2008. 
And um, it's great because I have a lot of friends at the conventions. And so, you know, it's pretty much like you're getting together and have a slumber party, you know, with all your horror yeah. friends. <laughs> you get to nerd also, out with your buddies. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But you're also able to promote your movies and sell your movies if you have a table. And um, and so, you know, we go and we we bring a big TV and have the TV up on a shelf behind our table. And so we're able to show people the trailers and, and it's great because the TV really catches people's attention. And so when they see the the quality of the films, I think that they really speak for themselves. And, um, Mm -hmm. and then they kind of are like, well, what is this? And, you know, and, and, uh, and so then we're able to start talking to them, whether it's myself or my fiance, who's really awesome about helping, um, or some of the other people that have worked on the movies, maybe at the convention. Uh, Char- the guy who plays Charlie, Adam Michaels, is an artist, and he goes to a lot of the conventions. So him and I have been kind of doing them together where he'll have a table and selling his art next to my table, and we'll kind of promote the stuff together. And so it's really awesome because you're sitting there and you're talking to people about what you love to do, about yeah. a genre that you love. And they understand what you're talking about when you bring up, you know, old ass movies that half the people on the planet don't know exist, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and you're making references to like a like trash from Return of the Living Dead. And they actually know who you're talking about and uh, stuff like that. Um, But but then the flip side of it is, you know, like I said, I did High on the Hog with Sid Haig. And him and I became really good friends after shooting that movie. Um, you know, we went through a lot of hurdles on that film set. It was, you know, independent production and it had a lot of issues while we were shooting. And so because of that, he not only became a producer on the film, um, but, you know, he and I and the rest of the crew and, and cast, we all became a real big family. And, And that really transitioned beyond the film to, you know, every time he was in town or we were at a convention together, we would hang out. And so I would sit at his table with him a lot of times at the convention and he would have a line of people all weekend asking for his autograph and talking to him. And to see that level of appreciation is really what I would love to have one day. And I'm not by any means comparing myself to the late great Sid Haig. I mean, he's a legend in, in cinema. As far as I'm concerned, he's, he made movies for 50 plus years yeah, and had the personality of, of a true Hollywood icon. Um, but, you know, being able to sit and see how he handled his fans is something that other convention celebrities really should take heed to because I see some of these celebrities at conventions and they act like pricks you know they don't appreciate the people who are pending spending sometimes up to a hundred dollars talking to them sometimes yeah and it's like people like myself you know who I I, you know skeletons in the closet was a seven-year project high and hog was a seven-year project you know the rake was a four-year project and it's like you're sitting here trying to beg people to buy your movie for $25 and it's at least a movie. They can take it home and watch it and enjoy yeah. it. They're entertained by it. But then you've got these guys who are signing their, and these ladies who are signing their autographs for a hundred dollars. And it's like, these people are sitting there like, Oh, well I can hang this on my fucking wall. You know? Yeah. And I spent a hundred bucks on it. And it's just like, they don't appreciate that. They have a line of people spending hundreds of dollars to talk to them and, yeah, you know, yeah hopefully one it, day it's um <clears throat> i was gonna because I'm, I'm a graphic artist and uh you know we're just starting to hit the horror circuit and it was funny you said um the fellow actor he was a um artist so that that's kind of what we're going to be doing like we're going to be setting up you know selling because I, I do horror art and uh kind of the same way but i've done a lot of cons as a comic book artist and i've met quite a few actors and actresses that are just they're so they're just not humbled to have these fans and it's like i i i can't wrap my mind around that i really can't you know and uh but i've heard stories about sid haig and like what a sweetheart he was to his fans like he loved and appreciated each and every one of his fans like he would sit there and talk to him for 20 minutes you know and not hurry them along or 
any of that stuff. But no, you're absolutely correct. I think everybody should take a page out of that book. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's just you. You know, you when when you're an artist, and you just said, you know, you're an artist as well. When you're an artist, the reason why there's the term starving artist is because it's the God's honest truth. You it's very true. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is very. And, and, and I were watching a, a movie last night, and um, coincidentally, and they had. Uh, it was the accountant that Ben Affleck movie and, and he's got a couple of like paintings, you know, yeah. one of them is a, is a Pollock. And I just, because I was curious, I was like, how much is a Pollock worth? And Jackson Pollock paintings, I think David Geffen sold one apparently for $140 million. Yeah. And sure. it's like for there to be that stark contrast between a painting that you can sell for $140 million and Somebody like us who, and I don't, so I'm sorry, I don't know if you're a successful artist or not. I do not pay my bills with my art. So I yeah, am the yeah. opposite end of the spectrum as Jackson Pollock. I'm I have some fans, Jackson. but it's nothing, yeah, it's it's nothing like that. But I mean, I, I never understood the Jackson Pollock thing because it's like, really? That's that's worth $140 million? Come on. Right. I draw pen and ink art, like old school. I don't use sure. computer or, you know, Photoshop or anything like that. And this guy just splattered some paint on a canvas and it's worth all this money. I, I, it's, it baffles my mind, but and, yeah, anyway, I digress. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I mean, and obviously we, yeah, we could, we could spend an hours talking about art, art theory and history. I mean, you know, I always thought that uh, art, it, uh, it just blows my mind. I don't understand. <laughs> you know? the one, the, the, just to quickly say the one that always got me that made no sense. I thought it was ironic and funny was, I think it was uh, Chappelle, I think, was the artist. Um, and he, he was a found artist and he, he did the urinal and he just put a, an old yeah. urinal on like a stool and called it fountain. Yeah, I, mm, I don't get yeah. it. Canvases that are just coated in white. And I that it, I, I don't I, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Andy Warhol has a quote and it says art is anything you can get away with. And yeah. that is so true. That is so yeah. true. You yeah. know. And so, and so that's that's just kind of what getting back to our original point, you know, I I often wonder that, too, is how is it that you can become so far removed from the time when you were a struggling actor or, or filmmaker or artist <laughs> to get to that point where you are now pissed off and and put oh, put back by the fact that you are you are talking to these people that love you for what you create. Yeah, it just makes no sense to me, but I see it all the time at these conventions yeah. and, and it's just so disappointing. Cause it's like, you know, you can, if you're famous, Britney Spears can take a shit in a jar and yeah. sell it for a hundred dollars and people will yep. buy it. You know, they, Justin Bieber had a lock of his hair in a museum in Miami, and there were people waiting six hours in line to go see this a, a lock of hair. What? That's ridiculous. No, I'm I'm not even making that up. That's a true story. Like it, that's, that's ridiculous. That's, yeah, that's ridiculous. During that's... during the peak of Bieber fever, like when he just came out, that was yeah. It was I read it on um I forget what I, where I read it. It's like CNN or something, and that like that made the news. Like what? Don't lie, Slinky. You have Bieber fever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my daughter had beaver fever, be beaver fever, and I bought so many boxes of those damn trading cards so she could get a piece of his sweater. And uh, oh god! So here I'm, grown ass man, buying Justin Bieber cards at Walmart, and the lady's looking at me like I'm crazy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I got her that damn sweater card, and she'll never forget it. So yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's funny. Yeah. I didn't even know he did that, but that's what I'm talking about. Is look at yeah, how yeah. much money. Do you think you spent on those cards alone just to get a piece of his sweater? How much money yeah. do you think you spent? Honestly, between my friend and I, um, probably probably about 120 bucks, man. Like, and I'm not even exaggerating. We went back and, three and times to get those cards. To and get you're them. one person. So it's like exactly. I, I <laughs> the 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 percentage of, of artists who are able to get to that point in their career while they're still alive, mind you to be able to make that kind of money off of any money off of their art. It's like, I've always said, and I, I swear to God, I swear to my mom, I swear to anybody and everybody who's willing to listen to me swear that if I ever was appreciated to a, 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 even the, the next degree from where I'm currently at as an artist, 
I will never lose the humble nature that I believe that I have because it's, yeah. it, 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 I mean, we, we create because we want to create, but at the end of the day, if you could create and make a living doing it, that yeah. is the dream, you know? Yeah. You know, cause I mean, a lot of it is when you see a fan, they'll come up and like flip through the book, your portfolio, and they'll see that one picture and like their face lights up. And that to me is amazing. I love that. I love seeing that, you know? Um, that's that's you, what's really cool about having a booth next to my friend Adam. Uh, his his mm -hmm. name is Adam Michaels, and uh, he does Adam's art box. And you know, it, it was really cool because again, not only is he a really good actor, and and you wouldn't even know that Adam is Charlie in Skeletons in the Closet because he's got two feet of hair, flowing blonde hair, <laughs> you know. But it's like even then, you plus he's also this awesome musician. He's the front man for a, a group called Cowboy Jukebox that's out of Chicago. Um, but then on top of it, he's this amazing pen and ink artist. And people will come up to his table and they'll flip through his books. And, you know, there will be somebody who loves Harry Potter or somebody who loves Marvel Comics or somebody who yeah. loves, you know, um, Craft or, uh, mm -hmm. or Evil Dead. And, and they see it or Pennywise and they see the drawing that they love and they just they instantly are like infatuated not only with the art, but with him as well. And then yeah. his personality reels them in, in even more. And it's, it's just really awesome to see the appreciation from fans of, of, you know, all that hard work. I would imagine that, you know, since you said you're going to start doing these conventions and, and yeah. I want you to, I'd love for you to send me some links to check out your stuff when we get off the podcast here. Um, oh, I that, yeah, that'd be great. You know, I, I imagine you would do very well with your art as well, because the horror audience really, you know, the horror fan base is so dedicated to the fan base that it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's so easy to sell horror fans horror content because they love we all yeah. eat it up, you know, yeah, voraciously, voraciously. Yes. yes. And, oh, yeah. And so when you find or, you know, see something that it, it speaks to you or, you know, wow, this is, you know, a great piece Uh it's you're right. They start talking to you and they want to find out more and they want to get as much information. And then they start asking you, Oh, well, have you ever drawn this or, Hey, you know, would you ever think of doing this? And yeah, it just, it starts, you know, goes and yeah, goes on its own, you know, exactly. but, um, but I'm very humble when it comes to that stuff. I'm insanely humble. Like, you know, and, and every, all the years I did the cons, everybody come up to my table. And I, I engage everyone, you know, and I thank them several times. You know when they when they purchase my art so so but you yeah. said that you were planning on starting to do some conventions here to sell your horror stuff what do you have any on the on the list currently that you're planning on hitting up gross fest um that's in july oh that's yeah july. yeah i love um, tim yeah no tim gross is awesome he's he's a great guy um yeah <clears throat> so we're that's that's our first one that's our very first one that we're gonna do we can't wait horror after midnight aka slinky's liquor pawn and video that's the channel name yeah, I um, love it. I love it. <laughs> Everybody By likes far, the my favorite the podcast name. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much, man. Because I mean, we we were trying to do like a horror, you know, because our love of horror. So we wanted to do a horror show, but the, with with the name Slinky's Liquor Pawn and Video, nobody associates it with horror. They, you know, it's just you know. Um, but the concept yeah. was that we were in the back room at this shady pawn shop in the sketchy part of town, talking about horror movies, and. So far, everybody says they love the shit out of that name. Like they say, that name is great, you know. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're you know going to run with it, man. So we'll have our little T-shirts and you know hoodies and stuff. Um, but yeah, just it's it's everybody's been real gracious and acceptive so far. So it's it's couldn't be better, man. Couldn't be better, you know. I will. We're we're debating heading out there for Gross Fest in July. So I I may see you guys. We may be. Able oh, to that would be oh, great. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be awesome. Yeah, because I mean, we're gonna... Guy, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I'm, since I'm not, I'm since I'm 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 hiding from the video here. I uh, it's hard to see <laughs> what I'm planning on talking, so I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, we we ran into Tim at Cinema Wasteland, and Tim and I have known each other for over a decade at this point. Mm -hmm. Tim, he. <laughs> He has a, he still loves, he has a quote. One of his quotes is on the cover for a chance in hell. Um, Cause he said it was one of the best short. It was in his top five favorite short uh, horror films from 2012 um, when it came out. And um, so he and I have been friends ever since it's my party came out. 
And so when I saw him last October at Cinema Wasteland, we we had a nice little catch up session and bullshitted the whole weekend. And then at the end of the weekend, he was kind of like, you know, I I've been doing this gross fest now. I think it's the third year this July, he said. And yeah, this and he's is the like, third. I I would really love for you to come out for it. So I we might, you know, it's an eight hour drive from Chicago, but I think we might uh, we might make the trip. Yeah, because I know I'm I'm coming to you from Florida right now, Tampa, Florida, and so you're a Sox fan in Florida. <laughs> no, I I I have a hat collection, but I am a I am a Bucks fan, you know. Um, right. Also, like the Steelers, because I attended cul- I went to culinary school in Pittsburgh. So oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, I knew all about the Tom Savini school, man. Like I drove by the place several times, just like oh, I went to school for the wrong thing, damn it, um, you know. <laughs> so. He but um, yeah, no, that would be culinary skills. And ah, uh, uh, yeah. Well, it's funny because when the student loan hounds call me, I answer the phone. Slinky's liquor pawn and video, and they just hang up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always works. <laughs> it always it works every time. Works every time. And um, but yeah, no, that would be fantastic because like I know Zane Hershberger is going to be there, and he's a big Spookies fan, like I am. So uh, oh, God. Gonna, oh, hey, I talked to Frank Farrell for an hour. It was amazing. I was amazing. Is that the director of Spook? Um, he's the he's the one of the producers, and okay. just some of the stories he had to tell us were fantastic. They were great. But I'm a diehard I, Spookies fan. I love the shit out of that movie. I, so. Yeah, that's how we originally that. met. So it's yeah, great. that's that's how Chris and I met. We over conversation over Spookies. <laughs> I, I just I wish it was better. Like it's it. I remember yeah. that videotape at the video store just being like, I want to watch it. I want to watch it. Finally, mm-hmm. I I was able to rent it, and I was just like. You know, I, even as a teenager, I still thought it was it was entertaining. But I was just like, this movie makes no fucking sense. It, but it's it so falls fun. out just it's craziness. It's just total craziness. You know what I mean? And the story behind the making of it is almost it. Well, it does. It excels past the the story in the movie. Um, you know, it's fascinating when you hear the breakdown of how that movie was pieced together because it's a Franken film. You know? It's, yeah, that's what I heard. It's placed together. Um, it's it's really fascinating, you know, but I just it's it had so much heart and potential and it just went so far off the goddamn rails that, you know, but like you said, the movie box, that's what jumped out at me as a kid. And yeah. that's, what you know, the Richard Corbin, that gorgeous artwork. That's what made me want to rent the movie. And, and you'll, uh, you'll mm-hmm. never forget basement zombies that fart. You know? <laughs> the and uh oh, damn it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. They, nothing gets better than that. <laughs> but no, that would be fantastic, man, if we, we got to see a gross fest, because we're going to try to do interviews with everybody there and, you know, just kind of get the word out. But um, yeah, oh, totally look forward to seeing you there, man. If you can make it, that would be great. Yeah, be great. no, I, I like I said, I so I work at a water plant. That's my day job, which is actually like I work overnights at a water plant. And um, so I work four nights on and then I have four nights off. And it's hard for me to take time off. I don't get a lot of vacation time. So that weekend in July, I believe it falls on one of my my, you know, four day weekends. So uh, so it should work out schedule wise. Um, I just I have to reconnect with Tim here and kind of uh, figure out if it's if it's again the trip that we want to make out there. But I would love to. I mean, it sounds like based on what he was saying and a couple other people have talked about it, um, it sounds like it's a pretty awesome convention and pretty successful. And there's a lot of independent love there, which is important yeah. to me. Um, it's, it seems like it's getting bigger and bigger. Like, you know, word spreads about it. And, um, you know, he's got some great guests coming this year. They're also going to be showcasing films there also. So that's pretty yeah, cool. they're going to have Film Fest, too. So that's that's going to be great. Because I think Circus of the Dead, Billy Pond, and Oberst Jr. are going to be there. So we're really looking forward Oh, forward. really? Bill Oberst is going to be yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. Bill Oberst Jr. and Billy Pond are both going to be there. Yeah, ah, so. I haven't seen Bill Oberst. Him and I... I did special effects on a movie called Dismal that Bill was the star of in 2008. I would love to see him. It's been 12 years since I've seen him. <laughs> yeah, they're, no, they're both going to be there, him and Billy Pond. So we're really we, looking we forward to talking to Bill to for a little bit about playing the the guy in the junkyard in Chop Shop. You know, the the first person point of view stuff in the in the junkyard in that movie and Skeletons in the Closet. We we talked for a little bit about having Bill O'Barrist play that character. Um, mm-hmm. No, but what a great actor, man. What a great actor. Like, he's a lot of fun. Yeah, and he's a really yeah. cool guy. 
seen him in actually quite a few things. And uh, yeah, he's he's good. He's real good. So yeah, that's <clears throat> yeah. No, that that would be great. That would be great. So so go ahead, man. Jump jump on it, Chris. I know you got questions for days, man. I'm sorry. Like you were just nerding out. Right? It's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of fun. The grandmother, like I couldn't really <laughs> figure it out. Was she like possessed, or was she supposed to be like some type of demon, or like what was her like thing? I I I like calling her a ghoul. Um, okay, you know, uh, like the 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 kind of true definition of a ghoul is someone who feasts on human flesh, yeah, um, yeah. and you know, someone who like robs graves and stuff. And so, I just that's just kind of how I always classified her. But she doesn't really need a type. It's, you know, it was just, it was a story that I really wanted to do. So, yeah, so I, I just, I, I thought it'd be really great to make a movie where the main character is a little child so that, you know, it's kind of from the child's perspective. And, um, and, uh, she goes to stay with her grandmother, her estranged grandmother, and her grandma ends up being a monster. And I, I'm a big fan of, you know, secret passageways and hidden rooms and stuff like that. So I, I just really wanted some sort of, of eerie tale that would be very tales from the crypt kind of EC comics style, uh, you know, with this kind of hidden passageway that leads to the secret layer. And, um, and so that's kind of how that all formulated. And, uh, and and again, that house, you know, the secret passageway, we had to build that the that closet, that pantry in the kitchen actually was a staircase that went down to a back door and the basement stairs. And we built a platform in the staircase. And so that floor was fake and the door and everything for the passage doorway was all fake. And um, and basement kind of the layer where she had all of her her stores you know of her her food that she was saving of all the different body parts and stuff wow now i, I wanted to add i just thought of this when you were talking right now um do you prefer locations or do you prefer sets or are you i mean because i know you can get exactly what you want with a set but you know does it lend itself better when you're at like an on like when you were explaining about the the house that you were in with the basement and everything, the butcher room. Um, well, to be fair, I've never shot on a set in terms okay. of, um, in terms of, uh, uh, narrative stuff. I have shot, I did a couple commercials for Sears mm -hmm. and, um, we shot on sets in that regard, but I've never actually shot on a set for a movie. Um, so I really couldn't create a comparison. I think, the great thing about a set is that it's a controlled environment. You have access yeah, to all yeah. the electricity you would need. You have yeah. rigging the above lighting. it so that you can hang yeah. your lighting. You yeah. know, um, you have the ability to move the camera pretty much wherever you want and control your sound. But, but uh, you know, and I always, I remember like when I was younger, before I started making movies, I remember like when Scream 3 came out and they were shooting, you know, the stab movies and they were on the set. And mm. it was like a perfect recreation of Sydney's house. And I, I always thought that, that was really cool. Um, and so I would love to be able to do that one day, even if it was on an independent level of, of, you know, renting a warehouse and building a set in a warehouse. But that yeah. just that requires an awful lot of, of time and money versus just going and renting a house for a month or two that's vacant and for sale and. Um, dressing it how you want yeah 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 and and the, the great thing about um about shooting movies outside of hollywood is that typically people are really excited about being a part of a movie so when i i i tend to focus on the locations and casting in terms of the pre-production on my films when i'm producing something and so i'll reach out to a couple of different real estate agents in the area in the Chicagoland area. And I'll say, this is the kind of house I'm looking for, or this is the kind of property I'm looking for in the case of a chance in hell, the world war two Nazi zombie movie. Um, I had a realtor provide me with a old, a hundred year old factory in Elgin, Illinois, wow. where wow. they were producing uh, stuff for 
uh, bombs in World War II. And oh wow, like a munitions bill. Whoa, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it was it was not always a munitions factory, but during World War II, it was one. It was no. used as one, and large parts of the factory were were not being used by companies. There was like a a plastic manufacturer in one part of it, and a, a tool and die guy in another part. But majority of the factory was vacant. And so I basically, you know, I went to the realtor and I said, you know, I've got a small budget, but I want to rent a space. Can you help me? And, you know, so that that's pretty much all you have to do as an independent producer. And and if if you're willing to make the phone calls, if you're willing to put in the legwork and talk to people, you can get just about anything for mm -hmm. for pretty cheap, you know, because people want to be a part of a movie. Hey, speaking of the chance in hell, where can we find that one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so all of my movies except for High on the Hog you can find at scotchworthy.com. You can go to the store on scotchworthy.com which is like a bottle of scotch and worthy like we are not worthy but you you know one nice. word scotchworthy. Nice. <laughs> um, and uh um you can so you can pick up physical copies of everything there um which I highly recommend and would appreciate because that's obviously how you know, we get our support is by people, you know, picking up copies of the physical media. And I'll, if I want, if you want, I'll autograph it. I'll send it out quickly. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you can, so you can get the DVD of A Chance in Hell at, at scotchworthy.com. You can also go to Vimeo and you can rent it or buy a digital copy of it from Vimeo if you go to Scotchworthy's um, page on Vimeo. Um but it's it's pretty good. It won a bunch of uh, best short film awards in 2011, 2012 when it came out. Um, as I said, Tim Gross, who runs Gross Fest, said uh, he said it was his in his top five uh, independent films from 2012. Um, so you know it 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 was a pretty cool short film. It was thirty it's thirty five minutes long, and I was a bartender at the time and had a regular who'd been collecting World War II um, war uh, uniforms and guns and equipment s since the 1960s. He was in his 60s and 70s at the time, and um, he always said, if you want to use any of my stuff, let me know. So my friend Johnny Hulusik and I, Johnny also wrote Skeletons in the Closet with me, as well as the feature-length version of The Muck, which is uh, a short film I did that you guys should really check out. Um, and that's also on my Vimeo page. And uh, a chance now, basically, we, we wanted to do something. You know, my, my cinematographer, Mitch Martinez, on that said, let's shoot something with my red camera. What do you want to do? And so we were <laughs> like, let's do a short film. Let's do a World War II Nazi zombie short film. We'd been playing a lot of Call of Duty at the time. This was back yeah, in like 2009. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so Johnny and I were like, shit, we'll, we'll write a 35, 40 minute, you know, short film and, mm -hmm. and we'll shoot it in somewhere around Chicago. And so that's what we did. And, um, so it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. It's nonstop action. The entire 35 minutes is just American soldiers being chased through a factory, uh, secret Nazi facility by these creatures that a, um, that, that air Bucher has created from experimenting <laughs> on concentration camp victims. And, um, and this is, you know, this was made long before, uh, dead snow and Frank. Yeah. And yeah. And any of those movies, this was the, the first Nazi zombie film that was out there. And, um, it was a lot of fun. Crazy. That's cool. No, it sounds like a lot of fun. And it's funny cause, uh, Chris and I are both physical media collectors. Like I, I'm, I, I got to hold it in my hand. Like I have to, you know, um <clears throat> so that's cool that you have... me. we we would yeah oh that. no we're we're gonna plug the shit out of you and we'll both probably pick up a copy of several of your stuff man like uh yeah most most definitely most definitely you know oh yeah, yeah. Cool. you support the physical media so yeah yeah because yeah, last night i even added um skeletons in the closet into my cart as soon as this whole quarantine thing is over i'll probably go ahead and pick that up and the artwork on that is awesome I don't know who did yeah. the artwork for that, but the cover work yeah. is great. <laughs> that's it, it's pretty awesome because that's actually part of how people like are drawn to our table at the conventions. They see the poster and they're instantly like, "What is this?" And I think it's like that green really pops on it, that green yeah. color, and the, and um, 
and the artist Ryan Glossmeyer, he's out of uh, out of Missouri. Um, I met him through World of Death, the web series that I curate, and he was a he had a short film on World of Death, and we, you know, when we reached out to all these World of Death filmmakers, starting to collect their movies for World of Death, this is back in 2015. Um, <clears throat> You know, I became friends with all these people on Facebook. And and so I started, you know, seeing in my news feed, this guy, Ryan, is, you know, he would do these big murals. These companies would hire him like this coffee shop and this brewery hired him to do these big murals. And so he did. The one that I remember was Lemmy. And right after Lemmy passed away and he did this huge, like six foot tall mural of Lemmy's face. And it was just super fucking cool and really spot on <laughs> accurate. And so I just reached out to him and I said, you know, I really want an 80s style poster for skeletons in the closet. Can you help me? And we, we kind of generated the idea together, the concept of it. And he just ran with it and he did a phenomenal job. Um, so, you know, he's just one of those people that, he kind of said, I'd love to do more of these and uh, and hopefully people reach out to him. I know one other World of Death filmmaker liked Skeleton's poster so much that they reached out and hired him to do their oh, movie poster, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So. See, and that's great that you went that avenue for the for the image, you know, for the movie, because I it, this is just my opinion. In the 90s, <clears throat> I think Scream. Now, I love Scream. It's a great movie. But the video box art for scream was just so lazy it just had pictures of all their heads on it and just that's it and to me for some reason that kind of opened the floodgates and it's like all a lot of horror movies after that point all their posters look the same like it's you know and even up to this point like it looks like they were just done on a, a app on a cell phone you know every, every so often you'll see a, a new poster for a movie and it's just like whoa shit and it really draws you in but um, it's yeah, it's it's a lost art, I think. You know, I think what what happened there is that <clears throat> Hollywood marketing realized that the most effective way, like what sells a movie, typically it's the stars that are attached to the movie. Yeah, so yeah. if you have, if you're paying the money to put a big name in your film, which yeah. I remember, Scream, the big name in Scream was Drew Barrymore. Very more, yeah. At, yeah. At the time, Nev Campbell wasn't huge. She was on TV, but she wasn't a huge A-list actor. And mm -hmm. Skeet Ulrich was nobody. You know, Matthew Lillard, that was his, like, first major breakout movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, so they, like, they were all new to me. So, yeah, exactly. no, absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, Drew Barrymore was the name. And I remember, like, I remember my room when I was a teenager was, like, the walls were covered with posters of half naked ladies, you know, Jenny McCarthy was a staple <laughs> yeah. in my room. And I used to have a Cindy Crawford poster, man. Oh yeah. I'm right there with you. Right there with you. It's just, it's funny. Cause it's like, you know, Jenny, like I said, Jenny McCarthy, I had like six or seven of her posters. I had like one of her calendars and now she literally lives like five minutes from where I grew up. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> man, if this girl would have been my neighbor, she would have been in trouble. Uh, but, that's, um, great. that's great. <laughs> but it was like it was like half naked girls and horror movie posters. And then I would yeah. if yeah. if if horror movies were advertised in the newspaper, you know, for theater show times and stuff, I would cut out the posters and put them. I up did my the wall. same thing. Yeah, I had a bunch of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> so I had the scream one, and I always remember it because it's such a dumb cover. It's <laughs> like Ghostface would have been so much cooler of a cover, or the knife, yeah. like the stab cover. I was going to say, the, yeah. yeah, the stab, yeah, that's right, that's right, ah, ah, man. you know, and, and so, um, and, because I always remember that in Scream 2 when they're watching the stab movie in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the theater, and I was just like, man, that, that poster is so much better than Scream's poster, and I, but that's because they wanted to promote the fact that Drew Barrymore was in the movie, because that's what was going to sell it, was the stars in it, and, and now every poster from Hollywood has the stars on it. And that's the shitty thing is that you're right. It like horror fans are a different breed of fan. They don't want, they don't yeah. want to watch the movie because of the star unless 
unless honestly the star is somebody like Sid Haig, somebody that has a personality yeah. that the fans yeah. relate to, you mm-hmm. know? Um, Those paintings were beautiful, man. Like they really were like they, they like again with spookies richard corbin did the poster for that and it's yeah. that's what made me want to rent the movie you know oh god i mean the the video store that i was like when i was a kid i i lived in a town called wooddale illinois and my dad and i used to go to ken's world of video and it was in an old <laughs> house and it was awesome okay. yeah it was super cool because it's like each room was like a different genre and you oh, know, that so sounds so, awesome! <laughs> oh, dude, it was, it was so cool. And so, like the 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 checkout counter was in the hallway, you know, between all the rooms and like the staircase. And and I re- I will never forget the poster hanging on the front of the counter where the cash register was was Return of the Living Dead. Oh, that's great! That's great! What a great poster! Ah, uh, that know. that poster. Oh, pretty much in and of itself made me a horror fan, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, the punk and, if you, oh, and, yeah. and look at Charlie. Charlie is a complete representation of that green zombie from mm-hmm. that poster, mm-hmm. you know? That's um, actually what, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw Charlie. I said, oh, shit. Okay. Yes. You know, he that's, just needs a mohawk, man, and you got it. Like, exactly. You know. He's, he's yeah, like, also an homage to that, to that poster. Um, because I grew up with that. That's that's what mm-hmm. made me a, a horror fan, like I said. And and Return of the Living Dead is such a great movie. And and all those films, you know, Night of the Creeps and House and, mm-hmm. and Nightmare mm-hmm. on Elm Street. I mean, the 80s churned out really amazing horror films. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it's funny because it's like you look at another one of my films, which I'm surprised Chris hasn't brought up yet, but The Rake. Which is obviously not as fun as Skeletons in the Closet. It's a much more serious film. Um, but the cover of that movie, like when when that was released on DVD, it was in every Walmart across the country, which was a tremendous accomplishment for mm-hmm. for my my team. You know, uh, we were all so proud of that fact. But you look at the cover artwork; it's fucking abysmal. You know. It it looks like a two bit fucking piece of shit direct to sci fi channel movie, and um, and it just it sucks because it's like the rake should be represented with such a cooler poster because if people were were more drawn to it because of the artwork, I think that more people would have watched it and would have appreciated it because it's I mean it may be slow and it may be very character driven and it may be a very psychological thriller type of horror movie. But I'll tell you what, I don't know if Chris agrees with me, and I might be patting myself on the back, but when that monster shows up in the rake, it's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, the creature looks awesome. How did that get done? Like, Oh, uh, you guys are killing me. I have to watch this fucking movie, man. Like, <laughs> it's, it's on Amazon Prime, dude. You don't even have to pay to watch it. Oh, all right. Okay. You, you uh, got it. But all I ask... All I ask people is if you're going to watch my movies on Amazon Prime, which Skeletons in the Closet and The Rake are both on Amazon Prime. They're also Skeletons in the Closet is available for free on a lot of other sites, too. If you watch it for free, just do me a favor and give it a five star rating or a four star rating. Give it a good rating because that helps make it more popular and more people discover it. You know, that's all I ask. No. Um, um, so, yeah, check out The Rake because it's. It's all practical special effects again. Jason mm-hmm. Kane, my effects supervisor, and his whole team, which consisted of a lot of really amazing people, a lot of which went to Savini's effects school. Um, they they created a full body creature suit um, that stood over seven feet tall, about eight feet tall, um, wow. and uh, it had an animatronic face, and you know where the mouth opened and closed and stuff, and um, and yeah, it just I. We were trying to make a feature length version of The Muck, which again is the short film that I did in 2014 um, that went to South by Southwest and Scream Fest and a bunch of other big film festivals. And we wrote a feature length for it and it would have cost a lot of money to make it. But it would have been basically if the blob had infected the 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 pipelines, the, you know, the potable water pipelines of a subdivision. Mm-hmm. 
And it was about oh, wow. you know, like a, a subdivision being attacked by the blob over the course of a weekend one summer in the 80s. And uh, we couldn't find the money to make it. So I was really kind of disappointed because my co-producers were like, you know what? I think we're just going to have to move on and figure out something else. And I got really sad because we spent six months trying to get the muck off the ground. And, um, and so I was over at my buddy Jason's house and we were talking and he's like, well, fuck that. You know, if we can't make the muck, let's make another movie. Why don't we make a monster movie? And I'm like, well, the muck is a monster movie. And it's like, no, no, I mean like a real monster movie, like with a, with a guy in a fucking rubber guy in suit, suit, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so I'm like, well, I would love to because creature, creature features are my fa- my favorite subgenre of horror next to haunted houses. Um, and so I was like, sure, but what are we going to do? And, and my, and Jason is really big into Reddit and creepy pastas. And so he's like, why don't we do something about the rake? You know, slender man's kind of been beaten to shit at this point, but let's do the rake. And so he, he had me read the story and I really liked it. And that was like mid October of 2014. And by March of 2015, literally five years ago today, we were shooting the rake. Um, so it only took four or five months of pre-production to get that movie together. Um, uh, I have to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it, it turned out really well. We, we, I, I was, I was very impressed with how well everybody came together to make that movie as, as good as I think it is. And, and, you know, it's, we made that movie for $200,000. I mean, and we produced it, we, we shot it for a hundred grand. And it does not look like a hundred thousand dollar movie. See, no, I was, yeah, I was going to say skeletons in the closet looks like a big, super, you know, <clears throat> big, big, big budget movie. So how much do you think we spent on skeletons in the closet? Uh, I'm I'm terrible at this, man. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. Um, million five. <laughs> <laughs> see, I told you I'm awful at this stuff. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, hold on, give me. It, let, it's been You're gonna blow my time. mind when you tell me. Yeah, yeah. One uh, percent of that. <laughs> oh, dollars. See, and that's what I mean. It really. Oh, that's. Oh, that's great. That's. I love it. Yeah, it shot well. The effects are great. I mean, yeah, the cinematography, like everything's very. You know, it's, it's the, the aesthetics are great, fantastic in that movie. They really are. So, I mean, it's a lot of that's a lot of sweat equity, you know, fifteen thousand yeah, dollars might have been yeah. what we spent on skeletons. But the sweat equity of it is where mm-hmm. the, the true, you know, um, the true value comes into play, because, again, Rob, Robert Patrick Stern owns a an, an epic dragon, which is a six K red camera that, you know, his camera package is very high end. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody worked for nothing or next to nothing. And. You know, this is why they're my film family. You know, these are people that are I would do anything for these people at this point because we've all been in the trenches together and we've worked the same group of people who created skeletons in the closet have pretty much worked on on the three last features that I produced and directed, High on the Hog, The Rake, and Skeletons, and um as well as the Muck short film and and a number of other things. And so they these guys also did Gags the Clown. Um, which is on Amazon Prime and a bunch of other places. And they just finished producing The Stylist, um, which uh, is should be coming out hopefully later this year. Um, so, you know, that's that's how we're able to make something look as good as I appreciate you guys saying it looks um, for as little money as we did. Oh, it looks fantastic. It looks great. You know, it really does. So, and it, it's just, it, everything about it, to me, in my opinion, it really draws you in. It really does. Especially if you're a fan of that era and that genre, yeah. so absolutely, absolutely. And and the rake is like <clears> I said, <throat> we shot the rake for about a hundred thousand dollars, and you know we were able to get a really great house for it, which was a perfect location um, to shoot this movie. And you know we've spent some money on the special effects to make the monster and all the effects work, and then we brought some actors in from Hollywood. You know it stars Rachel Melvin, who she was on. Days of Our Lives, I think, is the soap she was on for, like, the better part of a decade. And then she was the, the daughter in Dumb and Dumber 2. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. she she was, like, Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels' daughter in Dumb and Dumber 2. 
and she was the star of Zombievers. If you guys ever saw Zombievers, yeah, no, yeah. I heard of it. yeah, I think Chris saw it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great movie. It's a <laughs> great. Um, so she's the star of that, and uh, and then Shanae Grimes, who was in Scream Four, she was on Nine Hundred Two One Zero when they rebooted that, um, like seven eight years ago. Um, she's done a bunch of different things. You know, Joe Nunez is in it, who was in Super Bad and all the Judd Apatow movies. And, um, and then Isabella Miko, who was in Coyote Ugly, Clash of the Titans. And so, you know, we were able to get some, some Hollywood talent involved. You had some names um, in it. Yeah. 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 And, wow. and the production value again, you know, Rob and his team and, and the production design team helmed by Sarah Sharp. Um, who's been one of my constant collaborators as well. You know, everybody just really stepped up their game to make that movie as, as great as, as we could. And um, so, you know, I definitely recommend you check it out, Slinky, if you haven't seen it yet. Oh, I'm there, man. I'm there. I'm, you know, I, it, I can't get enough of horror movies, especially horror movies, again, from the 80s or, you know, throwbacks, stuff like that. But no, I'm all about the rake because I love monster movies like Pumpkinhead. I love the shit out of stuff like that. It's, so, yeah. yeah, it's it. It looks like an 80s movie, but it doesn't feel like an 80s movie because like Pumpkinhead is, is a great example because that's essentially what I wanted to do with with the rake. But to me, as much as I want to love Pumpkinhead, I just don't because the movie like the story itself, I think the backstory of Pumpkinhead's cool as shit, but I just don't think the movie's very good. Um, I just think that the monster's cool as fuck. And, yeah, he's badass looking, man, you know. Yeah, yeah. So like. The rake is more like it's it's got the psychological thriller kind of it's got the pacing of of a movie um, like Dead Calm or Basic oh, okay. Instinct or Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, yeah. But right. but I compare the rake to Candyman or Freddy Krueger if they were like a monster, if they were like a werewolf instead of a human. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. All right. I'm sold. I'm sold. So I'll probably watch that fucker tonight. Straight up. <laughs> Might as well. You're on lockdown. Yeah. I can't. Well, we can go somewhere, but eh, cops will fuck with you. So. Well, you, you <laughs> could always binge Tiger King. So. I I need to watch this because everybody tells me it's like Florida Man on crack. So I I have to definitely check this out. This this document yeah. about the Tiger King. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. My fiance and I binged <laughs> over the last two days. It's pretty funny. That's what people are saying. They said it's fucking crazy. So, yep. you know, guy was seducing straight men with meth and all this other shit. Like, whoa. So, mm-hmm. well, I'll need to check that out. Yeah, dude. You got to know what you're getting into if you ever come down to Florida, buddy. <laughs> well, he's actually, the Tiger King was actually in Oklahoma, but he, his nemesis is in Florida. Her name is Carol Baskin or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. They did like, I guess, a murder for hire plot. And, yeah. um, has come to find out he's he's incarcerated in prison and he's trying to sue netflix for like 90 million dollars <laughs> because of ah. this documentary you know good luck with that bro but yeah go i'm sorry guys i'm sorry you know oh you're fine yeah i don't want to ruin the movie for you slinky but um i just want right, to ask on, hold you on. Uh, let me keep my ear put out go ahead and ask him so hold on because I'm, I'm gonna watch this fucking movie man like i'm sold all right <clears throat> well, i did want to ask about the uh the bloody the bloody baby in the basement of the rake. It looked like really really cool. Okay, so so what about it? What about the baby? Like, what made you like want to throw in a baby? Like it's so um, like, it's not done often. The whole point is that um, the whole point is that that these children Ben and Ashley their entire lives have been infected by the rake, and the rake is a pestilence. You know, and, and we kind of took our own liberties with the, the creepypasta urban legend of the rake. But the way we took the the character of the rake is that it is a pestilence. It's like Candyman where it can appear and disappear and interact with our dimension, but it's not necessarily adhering to our dimension. Um, but so it, it like infects your mind. And once it infects you then it continues to spread pestilence to everything around you, whether it's people or things. If you notice at the end of the movie, all the plants in the house are dead and, you know, the fruit in the kitchen has rotted because it sucks the life out of everything. And, and that's why her husband starts to go crazy. Very Jack Torrance of the shining. Um, 
throughout the movie because it's sucking his positivity and his sanity and everything. And, uh, and so that's how it is with Ashley, which is played. She's played wonderfully by Sinead Grimes beach. Um, you know, she, as a little girl saw this monster kill her parents, um, which unfortunately was not really put in the cut of the, of the movie that you saw. Um, that kind of was edited out against my wishes, but yeah. Um, but so she grows up along with her brother, Ben, and they kind of have this, you know, the rake has infected them and her brother is kind of dulling the rake's influence by taking a lot of medication and has a wife who has helped him kind of get past it. Um, but Ashley hasn't been able to cope with it as well. And so she, you know, has been in and out of institutions and on medications and stuff. And at one point she gets pregnant and the rake, which has infected her mind, has essentially told her that the baby is, is the rake's. And what the rake does is it wants the whole reason why it comes around again, which, again, isn't explained very well in the movie because the cut of the movie doesn't really explain it as well as the footage that's left on the cutting room floor does is that Rachel Melvin is pregnant and, and the rake senses the baby growing within her and it wants it because as every, every Satanist knows children's fucking a child's soul is the sweetest there is, or you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like the most purest. Oh yeah. It's the purest. And so, the rake feeds off of that. And so that innocence and that positivity and that happiness and that love and that affection, all of that is what the rake feeds off of. And so it grows stronger when it discovers that, that Rachel Melvin is pregnant. And so that's kind of where Shanae the whole time is like, you know, I had to kill my baby. I had to save it from the rake. And so she aborted the baby and, that's what that nightmare represents is, is that the, you know, it's not just her baby. If you look at the fetus, it looks like a combination between a human fetus and the rake. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It looks great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. It's again, it's Jason Kane. He, he sculpted that. And um, I don't remember if he sculpted that or if, if either Tom Cassidy or Reed Fazar did, but we had, yeah. Or maybe you know it might have been one of the other guys. There was, you know, there was a number of, of artists on the rake: Corey Ruby, Aaliyah Kraft, um, Brandon Murphy. You guys done? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think so. I, I took my earpiece out because I was like, no, you know, no, dude, this has been great. This has been great. Like a lot of fun, a lot of fun talking. I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me about my stuff. No, no, the pleasure was all ours, man. Absolutely, you know. And want to thank you for your time for coming on here and hanging out with us. Definitely, you know, a lot of fun. Um, a lot of. You want to go ahead and like uh, plug anything you got coming up or anything yes. at all? Floor is yours. Now's the time. Absolutely. No, I mean, I got, I got nothing in production right now. You know, we're just kind of waiting out this coronavirus storm and mm -hmm. and you know writing. That's that's what's been going on mostly lately and developing the new stuff. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of going to the conventions and promoting all of our stuff and selling merchandise. Um, so, you know, we might be at Gross Fest and see you guys there. Otherwise, uh, you know, I, I just recommend if people like independent movies and if people like 80s movies in particular, go to scotchworthy.com. Uh, like I said, it's like a bottle of scotch and worthy like we are not worthy, but all one word, scotchworthy.com. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. My name is Tony Wash, like wash your hands. And uh, just <laughs> check check my stuff out. Um, you know, my friends and I, we love horror and we make some pretty cool movies, I think. So we would appreciate the support. Nah, ab absolutely, man. No question. Yeah, yeah I agree. Indie right now is where it's at because indie films are way better than stuff out in theaters. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we did a review of Black Christmas. Oh, man, he took off. <laughs> 